to aluminium. You had a car then which was equipped with power steering, which was still comparatively new, with in fact electric windows. You had air conditioning, again something very unusual in cars of its time. And you had a combination of in fact, a traditional approach, i.e. a wooden face here, lots of leather trim, and yet you had high technology for those days, but in a hand-built medcar. <laughs> I had an interceptor for six months, and it always reminded me of a cross between a sharp-suited Italian and an English gentleman with a plummy accent. Eventually, though, I got sick of its enormous appetite for jungle juice and sold it to a mate in Spain. Now, the deal was that he would buy it if I drive it there. Well, I hesitated for an entire nanosecond. I belted from Dover to Santander to Alicante, flat out, status quo, blasting out the eight-track, aircon at full tilt, and saw 135 in places. It was the drive of my life. Mind you, so was a petrol consumption. I remember stopping no less than 19 times. The car had a throaty uh, noise to it. It managed to combine an amazing degree of silence for, in fact, a 7.2 litre car um, with that marvellous uh, exhaust and that burble which only comes from uh, the most expensive and fastest cars. Uh, it was, in fact, a seductive vehicle, I think it would be fair to say, in every sense of the word. You had to be a little bit careful with the speed limit because it was very easy to do more. I remember once going up the M1 uh, in my Johnson when I was a minister, and uh, the police, um, I'm sorry to say, were unable to catch me, and at the roundabout, which they had right at the end of the M1 in those days, there was a policeman on a bicycle who said, I don't know why they want you, but come with me. So I went. The industry, the press and the public were amazed that such a small outfit like Jensen could produce a car that looked and drove like it was from the next century. To British motorists running around in Morris Oxfords, owning an Interceptor was as exciting as it could get. Not only was the thing drop-dead gorgeous, it was British too. But the little factory in Kelvin Way had yet another surprise parked behind its gates. The jewel in Jensen's crown was their awesome new FF. £5,200 worth of very special interceptor, boasting four-wheel drive and anti-skid brakes. A technological tour de force, the FF was a motoring prodigy years before its time. Jensen boldly called its new car a formula for the future and promptly scooped the 1966 Car of the Year Award. The FF rightly belongs in the motoring hall of greats. The four-wheel drive car that predated the famous Audi Quattro by 15 years and served as a testbed for those ABS brakes which we now take for granted. It might have been a Midlands-based hybrid with an American engine and an Italian body, but the Interceptor really was wonderfully built. It took no less than seven hides of leather to upholster this interior, 40 foot of the plushest Wilton carpet, and every single body panel was hand-fettled. Small wonder, then, that Interceptors earned themselves the reputation as cars for the stars. Congratulations! celebration I just happened to see a, a write-up on a Jensen interceptor I saw this fantastic shape with this impossible back window and I wanted one you know and so uh, once I decided to buy it and get it it was just it was just a wonderful feeling to have it because there was a kind of a, an, an elitism too I think what we all felt at that time that it looked like a space-age car I got the feeling that it was an eye-catcher I mean I drove it with flamboyance, and I have to say, this particular car here has a very great subtle color. I chose Positano yellow, you know, and I've always been a slightly flash. Uh, I mean, I used to wear pink jackets and things on stage. So for me to drive a car like that one, there's not only the shape but the color, was definitely eye-catching. But to actually feel that, that a car, or anything for that matter, was made for you, it's a bit like having a suit made for you, you know it's never going to fit anybody else the way it fits you. No one's ever going to look like I look in this suit because it's made for me. Same with a car. You feel, well, this was actually made for me. And there's this car wandering about the country somewhere, hopefully, probably still in Positano yellow, that was actually made for me. It wasn't, fit, it wasn't actually meant to fit anybody else. <laughs> I suppose it was really aimed, A, for those who could afford it, because it was uh, an upmarket, expensive motor car, but enthusiasts, people who really loved 
uh, a good-looking motor car and loved motoring it. We believed that in the Jensen we had a car with all of the characteristics of an Aston Martin, but with in fact the reliability a high-performance Chrysler engine in fact would give. Usually when you go back to an, a car that you've driven 100 years ago, there's all sorts of things gone wrong with it. You know, you, it's become loose on the steering and uh, nothing feels tight anymore, but this car actually feels really tight. And in fact, when I first tried it and actually accelerated, I was amazed at, in fact, how the, uh, the front of the car pulled up. So the power is still in The main thing is it feels solid. It really feels drivable. As part of our policy of raising the profile and of associating the car with the, 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 the lifestyles, if you like, of in fact, the successful, um, we brought in a couple of girls who we felt epitomised uh, that sort of approach. And we used them uh, in a number of areas, including the launch of the director car in Harrods. Uh, we wanted to try and associate as far as possible the kind of attractive upmarket young women that the successful businessman would see himself identified with. And it was uh, a successful policy, I think. When any in fact, American star was over here, whenever there was an opportunity to get the dealer or ourselves to actually place a car at their disposal, and if we could get some coverage of their using it, uh, we obviously seized those advantages. And uh, I have to say, it also worked extremely well. I think the problem was that we had a tiny, tiny budget, the sort of budget that we would have been almost ashamed to, 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 to in fact, admit to other motor manufacturers, and that really made us ingenious. If you're hungry, you, you, you have to be ingenious. For its day, it was the most remarkable car. It, it, it was the most modern and most eye-catching of cars, as well as having a, a very good performance. Well, we tried to find out uh, what sort of new uh, films and television series were coming up, and it was all part of a plan for people to have a perception of that as the car that the successful man, whether he be in business or professions or whatever, because we never saw the Jensen as a sports car. We never described it as a sports car. We described it as a luxury, high-performance car because we felt it was entirely appropriate for a successful man of business, a professional man to own. I think, actually, product placement, which is a term which has now come into fairly general use, didn't exist at the time, and I would certainly think we were the first in that field to actually go out into the marketplace and um, arrange for vehicles to be used in television series, in films and so forth. But as well as priceless TV coverage, Jensen had their own dedicated advertising agency to further beat the drum. And one copywriter, a certain Peter Mayle of Year in Provence fame, coined an immortal strapline and possibly the best description of an interceptor ever, supersonic velvet. The interceptor was an ad man's dream, a car to wax lyrical about. The superlatives piled up to shoulder height. I think going back into the 60s, uh, it was a better market, an easier market, certainly a, a more exciting market. Everybody agreed the Lantern George Jensen was a knockout. Well, actually, it was marvellous, because I think they were about the smartest car on the road in them days. I mean, actually, when I, when I decided to, to buy this car, I was tossing up between this and an Aston Martin, and I was doing the prank called Question Sport in them days, and I know the week previous, before I was made my mind up, we had John Surtees on the programme, and I asked him, I said, here, John, I think they're getting an Interceptor or uh, uh, Aston Martin. He said, oh, if you get the Interceptor, he says, it's got a, a Chrysler V8 engine. He said, you know, it's a tried, a tried and trusted sort of engine. He said, if you get the and he said, it, you'll have to have it all twigged up every time, you know, it's developed from a racing car. So I'm glad I did, because in the boot of the Aston Martin, you couldn't get, you know, you couldn't get a suitcase in there. So this one, I mean, it's got a marvellous boot. So that, that was, that's what made me get the Interceptor. Yeah. In them days, I was heavyweight champion, so I suppose it was a car that the champion should be, <laughs> should be seen in. Let's, let's get flash, you know, we get flash a bit. But no, it was it was a lovely car, and this was my, my wife's favourite car. I had a car similar to this, because this is not the one, but it was an Interceptor like this. Um, I had it three and a half years. That's the longest I've had any car in my life. And he would come down to the factory to take his car, always took it personally, and we'd have great fun taking him round 
the factory because the men literally stopped work and sort of wanted to shake him by the hand and call out names. And that was the fun of Jensen. That's what created inside the factory this great spirit. And uh, of course the owners loved it as well. Jensen might have been inspired at drumming up publicity, but they weren't so hot at making money. Their bank managers were always anxious men, but soon they really did have something to worry about. A worldwide energy crisis meant that luxury cars became seriously antisocial. I had the unhappy job of driving from a board meeting at West Bromwich down to the Bank of America's London office uh, with a formal note asking them to, to appoint a receiver. And I think that and the auction at the, the factory of the, the, the company's assets were the, the two, two um, up to tragic moments, the, the, the two really saddest moments of, in fact, my business life. In 1976, the receiver was called in and the gates at the Kelvin Way factory closed for the last time. Jensen failed for many reasons, but its demise was hastened by an oil crisis, ever more stringent American safety and emission laws, and that single-figure petrol consumption. Suddenly, the interceptor was seriously out of step with its era. It was a dinosaur, doomed to extinction.